At 7.20 in the morning on March the 23rd, 1918, the Quad de la Cine neighborhood of Paris was rocked by a massive explosion. Windows shattered, buildings were pockmarked with shrapnel, and a smoking crater three meters across was blown into the cobblestones. Mercifully, however, no one was hurt, but others would not be so lucky. Just 20 minutes later, another explosion ripped through the busy boulevard de Strasbourg, killing 9 and wounding 13. By the end of the day, 19 more explosions would be counted throughout the city. The mysterious attack baffled the Parisian authorities. The closest German forces were hundreds of kilometers away, while no aircraft could be seen or heard in the skies overhead. At first, many assumed the bombs were being dropped by extremely high altitude zeppelins, but what the people of Paris didn't know was that they were actually under attack by a brand new kind of weapon, a massive cannon so long range and so secret that many of its design details remain a mystery to this day. This is the fascinating story of the Paris gun, one of the largest artillery pieces ever built. The Paris gun, also known as the Wilhelm gun, after German Emperor Wilhelm II, was the brainchild of Dr. Fritz Rausenberger, technical director of the famous Krupp artillery firm in Essen. Both Krupp and Rausenberger had a long history with heavy artillery, having produced the infamous 42-centimeter Dick Bertha howitzer used in the 1914 Siege of Liege, Belgium. They also produced the 38-centimeter Langer Max siege guns used in the 1916 Battle of Verdun. In late 1916, Rosenberger approached General Erich Ludendorff, head of the German Army General Staff, with a proposal for a 21-centimeter gun capable of firing 100-kilogram shells to a then-unprecedented range of 100 kilometers, far enough to bombard Paris from the German front lines. Ludendorff approved the project and on the condition that the weapon would be ready for production within 14 months. To meet this tight deadline, Rosenberger based his new weapon on a 35cm naval gun developed for the Imperial Navy's proposed Mackinson-class battlecruisers. Following the 1916 Battle of Jutland, the greatest direct naval engagement in history, the Mackinson-class was cancelled, resulting in nine gun barrels being surplused. To achieve his new weapon's desired range, Rosenberger fitted these barrels with 21cm rifle liners, which also allowed them to be converted back to their original configuration should the Imperial Navy request it. Fast forward to early 1917, with the development still in the early stages, General Ludendorff suddenly requested a 20 kilometer increase in the gun's range in response to a strategic withdrawal of German forces on the Western Front. Forced to start over nearly from scratch, Rausenberger redid his calculations and found that this would require increasing the gun's muzzle velocity to an astonishing 1,610 meters per second. This extreme requirement created all manner of difficult technical problems, requiring clever engineering solutions to overcome. For example, while Rosenberger calculated that the gun would need a barrel at least 24 meters long, the largest rifling machines at Krupp could only handle barrels up to 18 meters long. Rosenberger thus decided to fit the original naval barrel with a 12 meter smoothbore extension. This, however, caused the barrel to droop up to 9 centimeters under its own weight, requiring the use of an elaborate cable tension support structure resembling a suspension bridge in order to keep it straight. Before each firing, the straightness of the barrel was confirmed using a special detachable telescope sight. The extreme forces inside the barrel also forced a redesign of the Paris gun shells. Regular artillery shells of the period featured a soft copper diving band that would bite into the barrel's rifling in order to spin and stabilize the shell in flight. The Paris gun shells, however, would accelerate so quickly that such a soft copper band would be immediately torn off. Thus, Rosenberger machined matching rifling grooves directly into the steel casing of the shells. This, however, created yet another problem. When the shells reached the smoothbore section of the barrel, propellant gas would leak through the gaps in the rifling, leading to a loss of pressure and overall performance. To solve this issue, Rosenberger added a pair of copper driving bands just behind the steel bands, which were also pre-machined with rifling lands and grooves, but also allowed to rotate slightly. When the shell reached the smoothbore section of the barrel, friction would cause the copper bands to rotate slightly, such that the lands on the copper bands blocked the grooves on the steel bands, sealing the propellant gas behind the shell. The extreme acceleration also required the 94 kilogram shells to be built with extremely thick walls, leaving room for only 4.6 kilograms of high explosive filling. 
As we shall soon see, this design requirement would severely reduce the Paris gun's effectiveness as a weapon. Interestingly, however, Rosenberger's assistant, Dr. Otto van Eberhard, proposed an alternate design that could have solved the explosive payload problem. Von Eberhard's proposal involved using a full bore barrel and encasing a smaller diameter shell in a multi piece cylindrical carrier what is today known as a discarding sabot. When the shell and sabot combination reached the end of the barrel, drag would cause the sabot to break up and fall away, leaving the shell to continue on its trajectory. By permitting the use of a larger diameter barrel and supporting the shell during its travel, the sabot would allow for much lower chamber pressure and shells with thinner walls and more explosive filling. Yet despite the numerous advantages of von Eberhard's design, Rosenberger rejected it outright, citing various reasons such as the dangers of the sabots falling on German troops and the risk of rushing such an unproven design into production. In the end, Rosenberger's original design was retained. A final major problem created by the Paris gun's extreme range was the extreme barrel wear produced by the massive amounts of burning propellant. To compensate for this, Krupp produced a series of 60 numbered shells of steadily increasing diameter, which had to be loaded in sequence to prevent an oversized shell from getting stuck in the barrel and destroying the gun. After the 60 shells had been fired, the barrel would be removed and sent back to Krupp, who bored it out to 23.8 centimeters and returned it along with a new batch of larger diameter shells. By August 1918, it was finally ready to deploy. With the first three guns installed in the forests of Crepe and Lon, 120 kilometers northeast of Paris. Later, two more guns were deployed about 110 and 91 kilometers from the capital, respectively. The guns, which weighed 256 tons each, were transported to the firing sites on specially designed rail carriages and fired from large concrete mounted turntables allowing 360 degrees of traverse. Unusually, the guns were manned not by army artillerymen, but by a crew of 80 Imperial Navy sailors. Further, to prevent French and British forces from locating the guns by sound ranging, the firing positions were surrounded by several batteries of conventional artillery to provide a protective noise screen. The bombardment of Paris began on the morning of March the 23rd, 1918, just two days after the launch of Operation Michael, the last major German ground offensive of the war. The enormous weapons were studies in engineering extremes, as historian Adam Hotschild explains. It took about three minutes for each giant shell to cover the distance to the city, climbing to an altitude of 25 miles at the top of its trajectory. This was by far the highest point ever reached by a man-made object, so high that the gunners in calculating where the shells would land had to take into account the rotation of the earth. For the first time in warfare, deadly projectiles rained down on civilians from the stratosphere. Indeed, this feat would not be repeated until 1942 when another German secret weapon, the V-2 ballistic missile, made its first successful flight. Also like the V-2, the Paris guns proved extremely inaccurate weapons, suitable only for bombarding cities-sized targets. However, Fritz Rosenberger's intention had only ever been to terrorize and demoralize the citizens of Paris, not to destroy the city or any particular target therein. Between March and August of 1918, between 320 and 367 shells were fired at Paris in four offensives, lasting from March 23rd to May 1st, May 27th to June 11th, July 15th to 16th, and August 5th to the 9th. In the process, 256 Parisians were killed and 625 wounded and millions of francs of property damage inflicted. The deadliest incident of the campaign took place on March the 29th when a shell fired hit the roof of a church and it collapsed on the hundreds of people inside gathered for Good Friday service. 91 people were killed and 68 wounded, including many prominent members of the Parisian society. While Parisians initially believed they were being attacked by high-altitude zeppelins, soon enough fragments were collected to reveal that the explosions were were caused by artillery shells, not artillery bombs. Suspecting that the shells were being fired by German agents or French collaborators from outside or even within the city, the authorities ordered a search of all quarries around Paris. Several days later, however, French aviator Didier de Ross spotted the Paris guns at Crepe and Lyon, putting an end to the mystery. The bombardment of Paris finally ended when the Allied counteroffensive of August of 1918 threatened to overrun the firing sites, forcing the Germans to dismantle the guns and retreat. To prevent the top secret weapons from falling into enemy hands, the Germans eventually destroyed them along with most of the associated blueprints and other documentation. Thus, while a spare turntable mounting was discovered by American troops near the end of the war, no other parts of the actual gun were ever found. For this reason, many details of the gun's design and capabilities remain 
remained a mystery for decades. It was not until the 1980s that Canadian and American ballistics expert Dr. Gerald Bull and Dr. Charles Murphy discovered a long-lost note on the Paris gun written by Fritz Rausenberger himself and succeeded in teasing out some of the superweapon's technical secrets. Yet while the Paris gun was an impressive feat of engineering, as a weapon it was largely a failure. Its inaccuracy and the low explosive contents of its shells limited the damage it could inflict, and while the people of Paris were initially shocked by the long distance attack, they quickly grew numb to the bombardment and did not suffer the massive breakdown of morale that the Germans had hoped for. Thus, in the end, the Paris gun was little more than a giant propaganda tool, a symbol of Germany's industrial and technological might. However, wars are won not by technology but by logistics, and with Germany's ports blockaded and the nation quickly running out of manpower and resources, its defeat in the world's end-all wars was all but inevitable. It was a fate not even the Krupp and the genius of Fritz Rausenberger could prevent. The bombardment of Paris finally ended when the Allied counteroffensive. The bombardment of Paris finally ended when the Allied counteroffensive of The bombardment of Paris finally ended when the Allied counteroffensive. The bombardment of Paris finally ended when the... <laughs>